The decision came down that that was an abstract idea they couldn't patent, so that's sad. But then the funny thing about it is those precedents end up really having an impact later on when you're talking about, for instance, um, computer-related claims for invention. So these are things where these precedents seem kind of silly in, in hindsight, and you wouldn't think it's applicable, but they really keep getting used in the courts. So one should kind of think about that. Now, if we went, and if we're going to be in an era where we're looking at like original intent and like textual readings of the Constitution, um, then why not go to Article 1, Section 8, where it says Congress has the power to basically promote the progress of science and basically like rights to the respective writings and discoveries. And so if you look at that, that doesn't really say fundamental laws of nature anywhere in there. And um, basically the idea here is to promote progress of science um, rather than just to um, protect particular inventions of Americans. Okay, so there's my like, pipe dream about like how we're gonna have something between, like where you get royalties off of like, like ideas, or if someone uses your equation to make money, you can have some fraction of that going to fund research, isn't something that I'm actually gonna advocate us being able to do. But the thing that I think we can do in the meantime is imagine, say we had found a way to get that equity or we had that wealth. The mechanism by which one would then propagate that to our generation is something that one wants to think about. I think it's an important question. So what I love about the Niels Bohr Institute in particular, why I kind of like decided, okay, here's the perfect place to be doing this, is that Niels Bohr got it right. Not only is his academic family um, really awesome, but his biological family is part of his academic extended family. So if there was something where our academic relatives had done something where it then is a practical implication and there's like patents that are using that as citations for prior art, and you see this nowadays with quantum computing, like you look at the prior art sections and they'll have some previous patents and they'll also have like Feynman's work in it. So if you're gonna be able to cite it as prior art that you can't then say is patent protected because it's basically published already, um, the kind of the, the thing that we would try to like mimic would be say an academic family tree. So some way to decide who is going to inherit based on I guess their productivity or whatnot, talk to that later. But the funny thing about it too is like to what extent are we already like a family? So I'm 29 years old and having gotten a faculty job, assuming I get tenure and I don't screw it up by talking about stuff like this, I will know some of you guys for 50 years. And so like that's kind of crazy because I can't even imagine those time scales. Um, and obviously what I do and how you guys perceive what I do is very important for like the success of my career and also my well-being in some sense. So we really are like a, a family. I'll see you guys like, right, like once or twice a year for that many years, it's crazy. And we really aren't that big. So if we look at strings last year, which was um, Brazil virtual, and you think about the number of people who are just signing up to register, that's not necessarily gonna be everybody, but it's gonna be a much larger swath than if you're looking at who's attending an in-person strings. You have just shy of two and a half thousand. And so if we wanna really include like you guys, everybody who does gathering amplitudes or whatnot, I, that's what I mean by string family. I'm not trying to be like very stringy. I mean, I'm celestial amplitudes. I'm lucky to be part of this too. Uh, we have maybe 5,000 in this extended family. And just to think about the scale of that compared to these companies that you're thinking about, um, right, you have like millions of employees at these large companies where you have to have a lot of distribution. And then the tech companies that we think are still like, oh, really cool, they got a job at Google, are still like an order of magnitude <laughs> or more, like so depending on where you're at. Uh, here, like much larger, so 150 some thousand versus two and a half thousand, or going to Tesla and SpaceX is about like 12,000, so just a couple times bigger. Um, and so, if you think about the logistics of like, if I wanted to really fund this enterprise, which is string theory, it's not necessarily like much harder than running a smaller company. Okay, and the other thing I want to ask is to what extent is our identity really tied to the institutions versus what we study? So for some reason, MIT gets it in your head that it's really awesome to be a graduate of that school. And so I wear my brass rat all the time. And you know, it's hard to say anything, or like say where you're from and not mention somebody that went to Harvard. Um, but to what extent am I really spending some fraction of my time there? And are the people, like the, the identity that I have being a graduate of one or the other institution, really what propels me going forward? Or is it basically the fact that I was in this, have an advisor who studied string theory and where I'm kind of in this extended string family. So given that, and then given also the fact that how long are you gonna be at a given university versus in your field of study? I mean, obviously, so a great example of someone who's hopped around within different disciplines um, yesterday, but typically, one would normally be in your field much longer than maybe you're at a given, um, say, postdoc or whatnot at a given place. And also, is our subfield really a priority for the institutions that we work for? So for instance, say you wanna move around, 
how easy is it for you to transfer your grant from one institution to the other? Are we getting the same overhead cuts because we don't have experiments? So like the amount of money that we bring in on grants is smaller. That already makes it so it's maybe not as much of a priority for the institution as far as the corporation of that is that an institution bringing funding in and getting their cut of that. Um, and then also initiating faculty lines. Like how hard is it for us to convince a physics department that they should hire a high energy theorists? And is it such that we end up competing with each other in ways where we should basically be promoting each other so there are more people in those decision pools to hire more of us, right? So those are various questions. And then the next thing to think about is like really when these institutes were founded, what was it like moving around places? Do we really need to be tied to a place? So of course this freedom that we have to do research versus being in like the lab or some private lab is great. But we can think about the fact that now we really don't want to think of ourselves as being like even American physicists or whatever, or Canadian. Really have no borders, no private interests dictating us, but still learn from the university or institute system. So just to point out, when you're coming to America at the time of like joining IF, you're coming by boat, and if you wanted to fly around, it was basically like a cruise ship type itinerary, where this is the advertisement for years after uh, Fold Hall, if you wanted to go on this exciting airplane adventure. So the question that I want to ask, and I think this is something that we can make step towards and not worry about changing precedents or laws or anything where it's a bit of a pipe dream, can we try to take steps to endow our field? And the important thing here being making our field an entity that you then can give money to and then also control um, basically it more than just like, okay, this grant is for so many years, if you don't spend it, you have to give it back. Okay, so I think the very first step for this is alumni relations. So the fact that basically, at least this is a little anecdotal, when people end up going into industry instead of getting an academic job, kind of don't talk about them anymore. Oh, they're making more money, that's great for them. But the thing is, is that the fact that they can make so much more money than academic salary is clearly saying that there's basically this discrepancy between what would be perceived as a value, and obviously we value our time and our ability to think about interesting questions. But if we view that as a brain drain, that's not great. And also the fact that there would be kind of no welcoming back, say, if they haven't made money yet, so we can't kind of get something from them, it sucks, because like a, a university would never do that. They keep <laughs> nice reunion events, they basically keep track of their alumni and are, are kind to them in the hopes that maybe a couple of them that are gonna be awesome and successful financially too, would want to give back. The second thing is we really do already have an annual conference that could be like a reunion. We have basically a annual thing, but instead of trying to like bring in previous alumni or have some sort of Ceremony like for graduating is like, okay, now you're part of the Strings family. It's kind of still like, oh, are you gonna get a job? And this kind of like funny. Um, so this is something that one could do right away. And then the fun thing is, is I can actually do that myself because I'm gonna be part of the Strings, but I'll say that in a second. So the se second step would be, okay, you have this entity, you try to have these alumni relations. How would one then try to get money for this thing? So basically, I think there's, there's two things to keep in mind here. Once you have an entity, like say I got some money from some pipe and I felt really guilty about it and I wanted to support string theory to basically like say, may I call flaw, I'm sorry. Um, there's no place to give it to. But I give it to the place that's employing me right now and then it'd be weird if I'm then applying for jobs later. What I give to the IES, the IES doesn't just have natural sciences and I, yeah, I didn't get a job there, you know, things like that. So <laughs> there really isn't a natural beneficiary where I'm saying I want to fund this research versus that person's research. And so we don't even have a place where if you wanted to say, okay, someone's going to try to profit off of our, the drama of whether string theory, whatever, like they can make money off of that on their own, fine, but there'd be no place to really say fund that research abstractly. And one could imagine various situations where you really do have a flow of money into our field, but kind of randomly, like whoever happens to have the right connections doing that. And if there really was ever a future patent thing, uh, there'd be a natural beneficiary that would basically persist beyond uh, the current generation. So, as a fun example though, if one really wanted to think about this patronage market, I think it's kind of, so I love Grimes, Grimes is awesome, and also these are just screenshots, these are movies, I think she made them in like ZBrush or something. Um, but the fact that there's an opportunity for an artist to sell their artwork on um, Ethereum for $6 million versus like the best, um, I guess most lucrative prize that one can get for a lifetime of achievement is $3 million in our field. Something's missing there. And so I, you kind of hear it bounce around about whether or not, okay, someone could just say their paper minted as NFT. Now the thing about my, my view of NFTs is it's really as good as the commodity is that you're, you're making. So there's some things you go buy at a store that are crap, and then others which you can have value to. So if you thought of it as, okay, 
I'm just buying this artwork, but I never own this artwork, so I can't have it in my house. Well, if you take the point of view that a lot of, like maybe a rich person would buy artwork and then put it in a museum, and then the fact that their name's on the plaque, they're basically a patron for that artwork, there's value in that. One thing that one could ask is basically, can I have it so that I have a system where I fund the archive going forward? If you look at the largest funders of the archive, they're, like there's one computer vision kind of fund, um, like Google and other things, but you really don't have something where the archive is self-sustaining. And so one could imagine if the archive itself is the one that's, say, minting a patronage, and then you have a way for someone to make money off of that paper becoming more popular or somehow having more value like an artwork would, there's value to the patronage in the same way that someone could try to rename a building. Like, whether or not you want to kick the other person who named a building off, or another family decides, I want my name on this building, someone gets paid, the person who originally donated gets some sort of um, financial benefit for like the, the, the um, act of having to remove that name from it. So basically, one kind of a way where capitalism can really help fund fundamental research. So I think there's something fun there to think about. Okay, and then the third thing is you really want to start small. I'm not going to say like, oh, we're going to go and endow string theory. That would be a lot of money. You know, have to make sure that um, you're not affecting the other existing sources of funding that you have coming in. But if you really think of it as just another small foundation, you're not, you shouldn't be doing any backer action. If someone says they're going to fund a new institute, you're not like, oh, don't do that. That's going to take away NSF grants. You're like, yay, do that. But then when they do that, they're like, okay, well, all I need is like, the best person to come to this institute. And so then they're trying to basically take another good institute and take someone away from that <laughs> to then make their institute have that brand name. So there's this kind of this funny thing where you, it's, not, um, it's not necessarily always just a good thing that you're adding more money. There's something competitive about it, which maybe there doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, so one thing that I think about for a while uh, would be to what extent can you kind of try to decouple the fact that you have a procedures postdoc at, say, the IES, but maybe the people there wouldn't be the best fit for what you want to work on. And so as a first year faculty member going through basically applications of like a couple hundred people where then you have to decide on one person to give an offer to or maybe a couple people to give an offer to, it's kind of ridiculous that you're doing all that work to basically assess people and then you don't have enough um, people that you're making offers to to have something where it's clearly a consensus that, that those, the set of people really deserve this. So I think that there's something inefficient about all of, all of us independently kind of judging people <laughs> and then not even being able to make offers to everybody that's awesome enough to that you get an offer. And so if you can centralize that or kind of decouple that from then a matching like program like they do for residencies, that would be one fun thing you could do with a much smaller budget. So if you had $3 million a year to actually spend rather than to give as a prize, one could fund like halfway 20 postdocs in like the first cycles of three years. So you can really have a much larger impact with a small amount of money. And then personally, what I think is basically we have this annual conference we have strings, but if you look at the funders for those conferences, it's really local funders every year, and it's still like order quarter million dollar price point. So one would really want to try to think about why I can't carry funding over. Like why is it that now that I'm going to be the main organizer for Strings 2023 uh, perimeter, that I have to go and ask Canada for money. That I can't just ask for a much larger sum of money and say, okay, this is for all future Strings conferences. You know, it seems much more efficient to try to create entities where we now have the capital that we control and that we don't have to give it back or spend it kind of unwisely, rush the last minute because it's user lose. And so now the question is if we can want to do this, so some of us are passionate about it for various reasons, the question would it actually end up making more work for the people who don't want to deal with this shit? I don't think so because right now you, know, you spend time reviewing and writing grant applications and hot topics talk funny. So someone who's a really stellar professor can get a bunch of different grants and so if, you all, if it all came from the same pie, you'd be clearer about distributing it more. So I think there's already a negative there. And then when we write papers that we then publish in journals, a lot of that in our field is kind of for the sake of, okay, this will help us with our uh, like tenure application or whatever. So to what extent is some of those things necessary or not? And then if you're worried about size, so somehow we like it being this elite little group or not, would it get too big? If you really had a value associated with minting a new PhD, then minting new ones would dilute it, so there'd be a reason to not have too many people in the guild. But by contrary, if you had a lot of money, why would we have to say our size? You could figure out what our size is, so it wouldn't necessarily be too small. You could have habilitation like entries, so we wouldn't have Freeman Dyson be excluded type thing. So there really is something where we'd have control over it. And now, if I want to take string family very literally, what would a rich person do? So I went out with an individual, if they had a set of money and they wanted to make sure my children and their children have this money going forward, they wouldn't just have a foundation, they're not just gonna give it away. <laughs> they have a family office. And there's some aspects of this family office, like progressing yachts and things like that. <laughs> like, so basically, like, uh, real estate, for instance. 
that one could imagine would be kind of fun if we had like institutes like this, where basically you have value associated to this building, right? But I can't go and sell this building otherwise I lose it. Versus if you have a house with some blackboards and the real estate market is good and it would make more money to just sell it now, you don't really lose, it's not the brick and mortar attachment, but it's kind of abstract network of people that are drawing from the same funding source, which then they can also invest. So to the extent that, okay, so say I'm a snazzy little um, string theorist with some great like schools that I've gone to and I wanna get a VC to fund me to start a company because I'm like sad about string theory, whatever. So I can try to do that. Now, <laughs> to the extent that someone could do that or someone could say that their AI or ML startup uses something from string theory or quantum mechanics or whatever they're doing, um, <laughs> that how, how, how um, differential geometry is useful for that, um, we could, once you have a pool of money that's actually supposed to be for the foundation, one would ask who is gonna manage that money. So you could create a structure where there's a reason to bring the people who would want to leave the industry or have already left the industry to come in and be the ones who manage that endowment and the same management fees is a source of income for them. The same with like a hedge fund. But also, along the spirit of, okay, so say our future people are gonna go out and have something that's going to um, be patentable or have impacts and be able to make money. The best way instead of trying to change patent law is to have some equity in those startups. And so if you have these funds where you're the one managing it going forward, you can invest in the startups of people who want to leave and do things that are more um, industrial and or like appreciated <laughs> economically um, at the same time and we have a cut of that to fund us going forward. So also ironically, the person I was supposed to, like I looked at the schedule before I was invited to talk, um, a colleague of mine was Celestial and is going into some ML stuff now. So she didn't come here, I guess. I'm not sure if it's exactly for that reason. But essentially, the people who are exiled at the time can really help us solve this issue of delegation of this funding, which is a different hierarchy problem for those who like hierarchy problems. <laughs> so going forward, people of my age are basically kind of sad that we missed out on the super string revolutions. And last time that Strings was in Canada, they had a panel saying, okay, so the super string revolution, last one was roughly 10 years ago. We want it to another one now. So we're gonna have this panel to try to talk about what would the next super string revolution be. That was in 05, so long time since. We can't necessarily make that happen, but we can decide to have our own revolution of a slightly different kind. So I invite you guys to think about the fact that we are part of a much older and more valuable tradition than any individual foundation or university. We really are a family, and we should be able to control the future of that family and um, basically fund our research going forward. So because I like playing as illustrator, I made a little logo. Uh, now, debate me. Okay. So, can't your market crash? You would say the same thing about university endowment, though, too. What's that? University endowment is also basically either hedging the market or, or riding the market. No, no, I know, but I'm just saying, but they're also very diversified. Exactly, so, so I don't think not, this is going to be everything. So, so you really need to diversify if you don't want to be destroyed by one. Exactly, and so in the same way that one hedge fund might fail, this isn't going to be everything, obviously. That's why I'm saying start small. But real estate portfolios, if you look at, for instance, like, say, kind of think about it. Apparently, universities came out of guilds in some sense, and then the first like corporation in the U.S. is like Harvard Corporation. So there's a kind of funny chain of things there. But like, if you think about like Trinity College or the different colleges within Cambridge, those guys have huge like asset portfolios. So there is an extent to which, yes, any given venture could lose funding. But in the same way that like a university that we're employed at or a center, like what a perimeter loses funding. Like, I mean, we, we all are impacted, so it's, the question is, I don't want it to be everything. Individually, as a hedge fund, yes, you want to diversify your portfolio, but also, <laughs> we don't have anything that is just ours to then fund us going forward. So I think that, like, I don't, I don't want to say that, you, like, this is everything for us, but I think that we need something. We, like, until this year, I don't think there's even a committee that decides where the next strings is going to be. We have 30 years of strings, and they had to, like, last minute during strings this year, like, pull Rob's arm to basically have a virtual strings and then we decide to make it in person. So like the fact that that organization is new there is symptomatic of something that just needs to at least exist in some level. But I mean, I mean, once you do something like yeah. this, I mean, you're, you're, you're subject, I'll be successful. To, you're subject <laughs> to the whims of a lot of other people out there who may not necessarily. We're subject to whims already and I think that we don't appreciate that. 
I mean, look at what happens when the government is interested in what physicists no, do. No, that's true, but at least the government is sort of more or less metastable. Um, I'm thinking, you know, if you get Elon Musk to start investing in your company, yeah. you may decide at some point to sell it off to a No, that's, no that's what I'm saying. We would own it. We would own it. That's what I'm saying. I want money that we collectively own, and it will live as long as we decide to still work on this stuff. I mean, like if, if, you, if you literally thought that there was a pool of money, that because you're an awesome physicist, you had a fraction of that pool. Not to say that that structure is something you have. Um, and then you inherited it by basically, my favorite student gets it. If that student then does biophysics, something like that it would bleed into other research fields. But presumably, like the, the type of, like the, the funding for, say, if I got a research chair, that endowment is, has the same issues as the ones that you're talking about. And it's much better that we're at the whims of our own money rather than playing a game of Simon Says or something like that. Oh, we're going to go into biophysics now because that's where all the grants are coming in. So how would you start the initial funding? I would just like basically call up people who wanted to fund my research and ask to try to endow strings, like the conference. But, the conference. So, but most investors want some kind of return. Correct. So if I wanted to return, then what I would do is the second option. So okay, this is there's two kind of ways forward. If I thought that my friends would literally wanted to like fund me, then I would say let's make str the strings conference always be funded, and then if there's any sort of return on the investment, if you have somebody managing that, have it go towards funding postdocs. But if I wanted instead to say no, and then this is kind of cool, like I, I hate begging for money. I don't need to beg for money if, if I can say that I'm going to get some people who would have gone and started a hedge fund to instead start something where because some fraction of the money is supporting string theory, they might be able to draw in the same type of investment one would if you were trying to say raise funds for a hedge fund, right? So I think that there's, there's two sides to that. You can have a situation where you say, I can make money by shorting like early stage quantum computing startups that are based on things that I know are wrong or something like that. Like you're like, like the, the, the only thing I know how to do, right? Like I right now could be like, that's not gonna happen. That like breaks whatever, it's either second law or something of uh, like the ground states and say, okay, I know I can short that. But ironically, if I wanted to short something that hasn't already made it to the public market, it's a little bit harder to do that. So you need to essentially have these kind of, the same structure that I would want where we collectively own some part of this, this field um, by have equity by being researchers. If you had that for early stage startups, the employees can basically then create an aftermarket for that um, and have derivatives um, constructed. I guess, sorry, I'm a little bit I'm not, I'm less of a finance person, but like if you wanted a contract where you could try to short that startup, you need to basically have some liquidity in that and not just have a couple of VCs already funding it. So, there, so would you, yeah. would you stay out of markets altogether? Other, would you stay out of external markets altogether, or do you? I, I mean, I would hire experts who know how to manage money. I'm not like. So, <laughs> so maybe a better way to say this is: It sounds like the idea is to sort of do something similar to a university, right? Reach out to the alumni. To start and first, like exactly. Essentially, exactly. It's not, like so, so I'm in a Hertz so, Foundation so right what now. What you want to do is not model a hedge fund. You want to model a stock index. I want to, sorry, like maybe a SPAC or something like that, like, depending on who you trust. I, I literally, I'm happy to take advice because I don't want to say that I would know how to do this. But the thing that I imagine is that if I had someone who just wanted to donate and I could set up something where there's some tax benefits to doing that, they're the foundation. If I wanted to say profit off of either the talents of people who've left our field and know how to manage money now because they work with hedge funds or have some cool AI startup, that would be in a pro-profit branch that kind of is on top of it. I would not be the one to try to make decisions about how to invest because that's not my expertise, but I would hire, like, in the same way that someone who wanted to start would, would hire people who are experts in that to do that. I personally, if I want to give an example of something that I'm, so I, a lot of the fellows that I've reached out to from the Hertz Foundation who are also high energy theory, we're basically, our grad school is paid for by, like, the rental car company's founder. So in that situation, we have a great alumni network and we have people who are really um, successful, but, you know, you're not guaranteed to always, like, make it big, like like begging your alumni, especially every year you're like, oh, donate a dollar, or like, you know, like pay for this retreat and things like that. Um, but what they started to do, and the person who paid for mine in particular, was that he would offer, basically, try to get equity for some grant for startups. And so that's where I really do like the fact that we do have people bleeding off into industry, and our chance of owning the product of the things that we do would be to have money that we can invest in them and have some equity in those companies. So that's based on an example where I had lived through that, but um, yeah. So I'd like to broaden the yes. discussion a little yes. bit, and I shall speak slowly okay. uh, and choose my words carefully. <laughs> uh, your parents' understanding of the word equity as lawyers oh God, yes. may be different from mine, because the first connotation that comes to my mind is fairness. I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> and so 
following on from my <coughs> affection with yeah. that meaning of the word, yeah. which I, I asked how, how broad is your family? The string family, I would want it to we're, be very broad. We're, 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 we're met here primarily as theoretical physicists. Decoupled enough from experiment or pheno, probably, so that you don't interact with like the funding for the, the experiments. Um, and I have very good friends that were excellent quantum field theorists and went into string theory. And yep. now, thanks to developments that I associate with Rand and Chena, have come back. Yep. Uh, so whilst I don't have any publication in string theory, sure. yep. I have a very lively interest in mathematical input from and to it. Exactly. So where would I sit? So what? Equitably, I, equitably, exactly. Equitably, so not being in competition with you, exactly. but being confraternal with you. So can I say? So let me let me put it in two stages. So I don't think we're ever going to have enough money right away to be dealing with the problem of equity being valuable. <laughs> like maybe it's a little couple, like you know, like I mean, like that extent. So given that, then what I would say is, if we really say funding postdocs at first, then say there's a postdoc who's in a different field, like like. I mean, cosmology is very fundamental still. So, so, but say that's not string family because of the way that the people who brought in with their goodwill donations, it's defined. You can, if you're funding research that's like ongoing and useful, then that's much broader just by definition of like who I'd want to work with me as a postdoc versus who I'm saying I'm endowing as a chair of like some, some faculty. So I think that the first stage runs into this issue less. At the later stages, I would love it if there were like different versions of this for different fields. And so essentially like, there's an ecosystem of things where what you contributed to gives you your equity. But, um, but I think that the problem of like, even the hierarchy type problem, like who should get more equity is something that one should think about seriously. But I don't think that it's something that we're not, or I mean, it's, something, it's not something we're creating. It's something where we have the ability to control the solution to it. Because right now already you can see like whose salaries are more, like everybody is kind of ordered by, by their net worth or their salary and certain professors are definitely paid more. So, and that's how you hire people away. So, um, I think that that would be a fun problem to think about at a later stage, but I don't think it affects the first round of it. But obviously, yeah, like we don't want to like be too inclusive in the sense of like having control over it, but we don't want to just exclude things by, by fiat. And that's where habilitation like thing was something I was thinking about, but this is the point. It was like more, more discussions about it. So, okay. Julio? Yeah. So there's kind of a model for this. So exactly, right? No, I think there's somewhere they're just doing, yeah. Yeah, but I guess my question is, say I meet someone yeah. who's interested in giving money to her for yeah. this, even though I, I like the idea of having some yeah. for everyone, you what would be the incentive for me okay. to now say, oh yeah, give this money to this rather yeah. than to me no, no. institution? Exactly. So, so what I want to say is that first of all, like, I mean, I, I'm a Hertz fellow, but I am like a Harold and Ruth Newman Hertz fellow. Like, you don't lose, like, the ability to associate your name to different things just because there's a larger foundation managing it. So the question would be, when this person wants to donate, who's literally going to control that funding? So if we look at, like, KITP or something like that, like, the, the conferences that they hold are not just in our field, right? They're in lots of fields. And that's great, and that's aligning with the interests of the people who, I guess, gave to it or whoever is running it. So. What I would say is the, the, the thing that would make this special, if anything, would be the value of it, like of the scope that you want. Now, of course, you can earmark things like you would earmark it to a university, but universities kind of can grab or, or, or change those earmarks because there's some limitations on what you can do. So I think that if you brought in money, then I would say that somehow, like <laughs> you could figure out how to earmark it within a structure like this that would still benefit you more. But the question is, Ideally, like for instance, say, say, we, say we did this thing. So let's let's do the the, file, the following example. Say we got Ed and Nima and all the like fun guys who have really awesome papers, and we know that's like art and very creative. Uh, to to decide to mint something like this, obviously we're not going to say just give it to us. We want some cut to go to the authors, and so that's the type of thing where like you know if you're, if you're providing a service, if you're working for this thing, or if somehow you're the one that they they wanted to earmark it for or name a postdoc after you, there's a sense to which even universities give up control over the funding and let it be earmarked so that that donation happens, <laughs> right? But the thing is, is do you want to be tied to some brick and mortar? Like, say I have a friend who's in some city, like why am I in Waterloo? <laughs> or why are they, you know, like in Stony Brook? Like, is it gonna draw the best people in or is it because no, this is like way a much better offer than other places, even if it's not the best place. So like when you're tied to a place, I think it's a negative versus 
I would not try to be coaching people is what I'm saying with this. So I think that that's a positive and that, yeah. Do you know, can you discourage? So, so one of the yeah. things that you might also worry about, I mean, I'm not yeah. saying it would happen, but yeah. um, if you set this up and it were successful, yeah. then universities might say, uh, why or why should I help this person get a grant because they're already being exactly. supported by this other you could, organization? You could say that already so, about NSF versus Simon, so yeah. So, so but, but I'm just saying that maybe the grant system then would just evaporate, and some people might, for example, have a better chance of getting funding through a grant than, than through this system. I don't think it would evaporate until it's actually comparable. And so, like, I agree. There is a situation where, it, like, in my like daydreams, where like we have we're rolling in cash or whatever, you know, and that that we've earned from from uh, investing in our own alumni. But like that situation is much further out, and or probably not something to be worried about at first. And that's where I'm saying start small. I think if somebody if like somebody wants to fund a little like center at a university, that's not going to affect NSF grants. Um, I do think though the fact that certain researchers can pull in more than enough money for themselves and then people are still left out because like when you're when you're reviewing these grants are you kind of assessing like do I trust this do I know that like, this person's pedigree and things like that I feel like you could actually have a more equitable distribution within your family however that's defined and then if you're not in it then it's clear that you you're not covered by this so I think that's a great goal to make it more equitable yeah Can yeah be sure that that would be I mean could you somehow have something to make sure that that would happen? This is why I want to bring it up to you guys, because I, even if I could like, pull in all of my, like, I may help us for things that happened in the past, or like at whatever, like, I would not, I want this to be a problem that we solve together, because I don't think it has any value unless it's something that we all think about. And I think it's something that we, like, I want to make it so that we can think about it. That's not a pipe dream to think about, but I would not want to be the one telling you, oh, this is what it should, yeah. I mean, I think I think you need a lot of people working together exactly. for a long time in order yeah. to make something where you have to be sure. Oh, exactly. But but, but but I think that I am more. Com I'm not confident that it, that it would take a short amount of time, for instance, to create a better version or more equitable version of the funding system. But I do think you could kind of train, like, to guess who would get an NSF grant. Like, there are certain grants in Canada that I would basically know that I'm going to get. If I applied for it, why do I have to apply for it? If it's going to be like automatic, and I'm going to get like fifteen thousand, or why are my grad students paid so little, like eighteen thousand? <laughs> Various things. If they're automatic, why make you go through those hoops? Let like the big names get their funding, and then have like a like a more thorough review for people who would be not known. Is what I, my I envision, but I want it to be not just my vision of this. So, so, would you want to dispose of applications for grants, or just have people? I would want to under publications, or. I would want to dispose it for the people where you know they're going to get it. So if like, say you start a person who just got hired at some big league US institution, they're going to get an NSF early career grant. If we had the funding where we were actually the ones bankrolling that, why make them apply? That's my attitude. But that's very optimistic because you would require a lot of funding to be able to just be like, NSF career grant, here you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for this question of scales, yeah. uh, I mean, you compared this to universities yeah. and to family funds, but the, yeah. the closest analog that I can think of yeah. is really something more like the Yes, right? Where you've got an organization that's but discipline wide, you, albeit nationally specific. Yes, so nationally specific, I don't like that, and discipline wide is actually very broad. So I think that if you try to cluster, like, so what I find is funny is when we're at these faculty meetings, I'm surprised, maybe it's because I care a lot about my other quantum physics and strings faculty, that we come to a consensus a lot more. So I wish that whatever pool of funding there is, you have it clustered into people who are more likely to have a consensus on like the research directions, mm -hmm. and they control that funding, in, aka like they're not competing for. Okay, but NPS yeah. does have divisions that. Maybe, but those down. are pretty broad, and and I would say if you have to basically pay to give a talk at a conference, that money like it's more of like a union or something like that where they're representing you versus where you're getting equity and there's value in it. Sure. Like I shouldn't have to pay to join. Like sure. nobody should be paying to join a society. Sure, but I think a, a connecting yeah. point, which is kind of what I was trying to lead to, is. The APS, in principle, could use some of these same methods, right? They sure. can reach out to their alumni, they probably do. Yeah. They don't really have this kind of funding. So is your, exactly. is your sort of contention that sort of string has a higher density of people making lots of money as alumni? And I feel like there's that, that and we have a lot of goodwill. So I mean, like, and then we might lose that goodwill and some people would be old and retire. Like, we have goodwill that we can capitalize on now that I think could fund us. And I think that we should cluster it around, like, why would we do strings and not amplitudes? In amplitudes, we have a couple, like you know, like like some fraction of the number of people that we could raise, really raise money for if we went a little bit broader. Now, you you start changing that to see like what's the best impact for a community, <laughs> and I think that that's where I'm sticking to the strings family thing because I can talk about a conference that I want to fund, and 
it's easier to talk about that scope, and I think there's some sort of clustering or consensus that one could try to actually like mathematically or model to define that. I think that the APS thing is is, is is great to the extent that they're representing us, and it's kind of this union, but it's still like I would have to pay to join the Canadian version of these things. It's kind of like a lobbying group type thing. I don't like that the fact that it's centered in, in a country, for instance. I think that the, the field versus the country versus the institution is the important thing. And then also the control being something where it's your sector has this control and doesn't have to give the grants back, for instance. Like, like being able to invest that money is something that we don't have, that any sort of company would, would have. So, yeah, Yeah, I'm, I'm of course very sympathetic with this idea you said yeah. at the beginning of uh, removing borders. Yes. I guess this was one yes. idea. And second is secure, securing this freedom of free independent scientific Exactly. Which is crazy. Yeah. Something I, I, I fear a little bit that thinking of this as a string family instead of removing borders can create also borders. And this is related to David's context to comment because uh, probably for many of us, uh, if we're thinking of family, it's more of a family of theoretical physicists yes. or more generally yes. yeah. scientists. And, and I think theoretical physicists, because once you go into experiment, I mean, like it's a different, there's different time scales. You want to isolate it to a, something where it's, it's right. not constrained and by other like, funding. For many of us, uh, many of my colleagues, you know, if there is a, a closed club yeah. based on, uh, I would say, Maybe a bit of artificial border. Yeah. It will create an artificial border between me and my colleagues. But there already is, though, with funding. I mean, when I when I get hired, if I like a faculty line is created, like it's targeted to a given, like I mean, a condensed matter theorist versus a like a high energy theorist is going to be a different faculty line. These borders exist in these fields, yes, and, and so I don't want to create anything more than that because I would hope that condensed matter has their own set of funding too, and then it can move. So maybe I would uh, along these lines yeah. for, would see uh, again a way to remove these borders and. Well, let's say it's a theoretical physics yep. family, and there is a secured money to create a conference every year. Yep. But again, for the for the health of our research, it's good to to compete yep. and to talk to each other yep. and say instead of paying for strings conference every year, we can apply and again <coughs> see what everyone is doing and based on scientific quality and not just the history and the names. Of, you know, there was some great results 20 years ago when yeah. we inherited the strings. And now what we're doing is completely irrelevant. We still receive money. Is this a but, point? But I, so what I do think, though, look, I, I, the issue with that is that once you then have people who can vote and then totally dis, I mean, like when you see this at, at physics departments too, like the, the way that strings is treated compared to the goodwill that we bring in and the kind of the popular science thing, like we have a value that then becomes undervalued when it comes to hiring new people because of the fact that, I mean, it literally takes you way longer, I think, nowadays to get up to speed and to be able to contribute to. So we're optimizing for the wrong time skills, I think. Like, we do research to impress the people who are gonna hire us for the next stage of our career instead of really doing, like, whatever we, we think is fundamentally interesting. So the thing that I'm scared of is, like, that the, the way that you're talking about it, too, which I, I do want it, I want it to distribute. But the first thing that I'd be worried about is, since it's the same thing as in a department, we're basically less and less, like, Simon's obviously covers a lot of stuff for us, but they're going more into like computational things. They're going into what they think is useful. So the extent to which, say somebody's earned it. So say I have literally earned money, I can then let my kid do their passion. So the way that it's inherited, I think would kind of mitigate this problem in some extent. So say you really had it where like Naughty like sold his NFTs and got some funding for research and then could decide where that goes to. If he goes into Guinness Matter, it leads into these other research fields. So like the fact that you're collaborating with the person would mean that they get some of that equity because you're paying for your collaborators, say. You're paying for their time or their resources. So I think that if you have a model where the, the person who has made the thing can also decide where it goes to, there, you can kind of keep the thing alive a little bit longer, but eventually the, people aren't gonna wanna do something that isn't interesting to them. So I think it will merge into other fields. So I think that this kind of model where the equity really does flow with like some sort of rule for who is gonna get mine, and, so, and not like my family members, not my kids, uh, but my academic family, that it'll, it'll, it'll bleed. And if string theory doesn't exist, eventually it will turn into something else, right? It'll go into that. I, I think that that still, I think it solves it. But first, but for the first like fundraising, we wanna use like the greats in our field. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a more detailed question about the yeah. NFT as a new yeah. part, which I find very interesting. But yeah. Since we have thought more about it or have more information, yeah. uh, trying to start minting highly cited articles and yeah. Nobel Prize winning articles, yeah. 
Is that anything known about the market today? I think it would be, no, so, so what I really want, I want to like, so I, I, I'm near Wee Waterloo, so I'm like really trying to get into Vitalik Buterian or some, either him or Sam Beg me free to like be on board with this, because Sam went to MIT with me, I don't know him, but like I would love if we could get somebody who is interested in NFTs and interested in science to help us really get it out there, because I think there's a market, there's definitely a market. We know that it's like, I mean, as far as artwork and its value, like we can assess that, we're like the connoisseurs of that thing, um, but you need, <laughs> You need to have people wanting to buy it there. So Grimes is popular, you know, that, that helps. So I think if we push for it collectively and we had like Christy or like whatever, like an opening for it, we could make it happen. I'm confident that there are people's papers who I could get money for. But um, I think it has to be something where it's like the archive doing it so that it can be done again. And so like there's a system for it. Uh, I think yeah. But I don't think exactly. Yeah, Tua Nima isn't here. No, 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 the, but there's, the, that is exactly, the, I, I don't. I haven't looked to see if anybody's tried to do it on their own. I heard people like joke about doing it, but I think the fact that they haven't is a good thing because we need to. I think you really need to be like this collection of papers is going out and like this is going to fund the archive. It's going to basically be a patronage and, and not just like that. There's value attached to it, right? Like it's there. There like like there's a clear value to being the person who has supported the research of Edwin, for instance. And even if it's paid later, like why would I do artwork if not later to be, you know, to be paid for that artwork, right? If I was a painter, but I'm, I'm confident it could, it, it, with the right people, I think it could happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a huge fan of like the funding part. Yeah. Of the, uh, of the like NFT, uh, of, like NFT thing. What I'm not that big a fan of is like the environmental impact of that entire structure. No, but they're going to uh, stake a uh, proof of stake instead of uh, proof of work. So, <laughs> I think Ethereum is going to be more environmentally friendly. I'll, I'll, I'm, a, I'm like, new, like a new, you know, like just like kind of enthusiast for like different possible markets for our stuff. So, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but I think they are transitioning or merging to something where it's going to be less energy intensive, t intensive for, for Ethereum. Yeah. No, no, I guess the other question is if you've got a persistent identifier of patronage or yeah. archive itself, then yeah. do you need the NFT? No, so, so what I'm saying is, okay. You're using the fact that the NFTs create this art, have this market, like in the same that like, you could have sold, I mean, you could have sold the name on a building already. Right. So this, like this structure, this popularity of NFTs has basically made something liquid that wasn't liquid before is what I would say. I would view it that way. They created liquidity and the commodity is as good as something you could have had before. But to the, like, I'm not gonna argue about, <laughs> like, I'm sure like someone who really cares about blockchain could say why it's better, like why you trust that ledger versus like trusting like us saying, or the archive saying yes, it's this. But I think that, right, like I don't want to counter the point that everybody could just create their own thing, but I think that there is a more consistent value to something if you do have it being through the archive and you can fund the archive, and that's good for us. Right. But of course, nobody should be told not to do their own minting, right? <laughs> like I'm not going to tell anyone what they can't do. I just like how want to create something. How would you bring someone in? And under what circumstances? So, so this is something that inevitably is a very painful question, but yeah. probably needs to be dealt with. How would you kick somebody out? Because very often, I mean, people yeah, how would I write grants yeah. for many years. I mean, a great example is Halton Arp, who, who was claiming that the red shift was somehow natural mm -hmm. and not due to the, to the university's expansion. At some point, he was finally told, we're not funding you anymore, we're not giving you any more time. So you could imagine a situation where someone is, is not being productive in some way, but they could probably still get their papers on the archive. All you have to do to get your paper on the archive is, is just write something that sounds at least halfway consistent. So, so the, right, the value that you get from minting in the archive would be depending on like who you are in the so, so the thing you're worried about, I guess, is somebody who's popular who is bad. This is where I kind of or like the reverse, or somebody or, who's yeah. you know yeah. somebody might be working in the middle of Botswana somewhere, sure. and no one's ever heard of them. No, I, I agree, but they are those guys are already screwed right now, which is bad. I think so, 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 I think there's a part of me that thinks that the consensus of the field is a good is a better indicator than any individual's either persona to the public or their own value of themselves. So this is very the thing that Sasha's scared of, <laughs> where it's like, I mean, if I if I start writing too many papers, like I know I'm gonna get shit. I'm gonna feel like what people think. Of, like I know what people think about my subfield. Like I know it, even if I want to pretend that it, like, they don't. Like you have a sense of consensus when a small, with a small enough community that ultimately whatever say vote delegation based on seniority, which isn't necessarily great because then the older people are controlling things. But if it's based on like the the fact that they're able to get value from the papers that they minted, I think it makes more sense. Um, I think that if somebody, like what I dislike and what I, this is where I would never tell someone they couldn't do it, right?
But I really do like this notion of us being the people who have some organization where we can then basically commission. See, see okay, measuring. So I was in a situation before where basically you know, a lot of like outreach opportunities, but you don't deserve to have those things. And the way around it, I think, is if you had, to, like imagine the people who right now write books like for popular science, they're normally kind of like other in some, other in some sense. There's a way that they're talked about sometimes in the field. Like, oh, that's great, they're able to do this. It kind of feeds back ultimately into funding, but maybe it doesn't if they're trying to batch string theory to get likes or whatever. So uh, I think that if you had an entity that you could approach to, to and then we actually had, like trained our grad students or whoever to say the way that we wanted to present what we do, like you could have better quality, like a better product here than any individual person who's trying to get that clout and go out there. So you could prevent something like, like the next so-and-so from happening <laughs> because there'd be like a consensus or a, like a body that one could ask for like the, the voted opinion on rather than like any individual professor who's gonna be nice about a person. Um, so I think that that, I think that there's some value to the consensus that really, so, so the downside is right now it's like whoever, everybody agrees on a couple of people being really, really awesome and you can see that they're friends with some high net with individuals who then, like, I don't know, they mingle with, but like their, their success is also rooted in a larger community following and caring about what they do. So I want to create something where basically there's still this consensus that we kind of know, like, oh, that's a cooler paper, you know, just because it has citations, it doesn't mean it's better. But like that, like, I think that doesn't exist unless like kind of everybody has some vote, even if it's weighted. So I think I, I kind of, I think I've addressed your question in some sense, but maybe I, like, I can say it again if, if I didn't quite, uh, I want there to be an, like some weighted vote, and I think that if we would kick somebody out, you know who's like the weakest link. Goodbye. I'm just concerned because sometimes someone may be saying something controversial. Yeah, that's they might be wrong. Yeah. They might be right. Okay. Sure. So if they have, so my, my attitude would be if they were able to pull in the research funding based on their work. So like, say their NFT made money, and like their equity is something larger because of past work, then that's the same way that people who have seniority have done great things in the past are believed longer than a new grad student saying the exact same thing. We see, we see that already with like, like solving information paradox well, proposals. We do it, but it's like, not, some people don't regard it as fair. Yes, but the question is, is, is it more fair or less fair if you can quantify it and then you can actually tweak parameters to change it? I don't want to be the one to propose that you could tweak parameters, but you could definitely distribute, redistribute everything right, if you wanted to. Saying, you don't want to be a clone of the system as it is. I agree, but I think I want to start, the, the reason why I want to start is something like a clone with more control is that I know the bad sides of it already. And then you're just trying to start eking your way into something where you have more and more control, and then you have time to think about making it better. Because it's a lot easier to make a system better when you have control over it collectively than if you don't. And at right now, like, we can wish the university system was different all we want. We don't have anything to say, here's the money, the money is the power. Yeah, my attitude, but. No, okay, wait, sometimes, wait. sometimes the problem isn't that outsiders are controlling your field, yeah. maybe insiders are controlling your field. Yes, but what I want to say with that is imagine if you had a situation where there's more funding and then longer term postdocs. So instead of this three year thing where you're trying to impress the person who you're working with to get a rec letter for, you can literally do what you want to do. I think that there'd be better opportunities for younger people to do things that they're passionate about and gain traction that way. And especially if, if the votes weren't all delegated and there is more people who has a say, rather than just like the, the top couple people, which I think have like our respect and also have influence on funding, I think that that's strictly better than it is now. I, I think I can make something better than what is now. That's all I want to make, just like Epsilon better. Yeah. There's also one that's considered the trajectory of current funding yeah. and all these things. It's definitely not but we do have a lot of people who are like going and making money quickly and then come back. So I feel like, like to the extent that we want to embrace this kind of like leaving to come back, like I think we should. I think we should get in, be getting something for it. Um, but I think that if we have it, like you could also train people better. But what I like is this notion of being able to employ our own uh, people who want to leave the industry or have left. I think it's better than trying to say get a cut of like referring them to a hedge fund because I think it's kind of like predatory to be like, oh you didn't make it, so like here we're gonna like send you off there and. Get a cut, like I don't like that. Um, but yeah, so right. So. Yeah. Okay, well. Thank you guys for <laughs> Sounding like the discussion is cooling down a little bit, or at least <laughs> maybe we can move it to sort of the informal context of the break and then okay. be back at quarter, quarter uh, till for the next.
So let's thank Sabrina again.